Hi everyone, I'm Michael Short. This is Let's Go Outdoors. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors, me and you. Let's Go Outdoors with Michael Short. Supported by the Alberta Conservation Association. Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Go Outdoors. I'm Michael Short. Coming up, how healthy is the walleye population in the Lac La Biche area? We'll check out what biologists have caught in their nets on the Owl River. Firing a shotgun for the very first time can be a bit nerve-wracking. We'll see if our aspiring hunter, Mary, can overcome her fears with a little help from an expert. Go ahead and pull the trigger. For real, I'm actually going to pull it. Can laser beams be an answer to keeping waterfowl away from tailings ponds? It's just one of the methods a researcher is using to scare birds away. So Mary, you successfully completed your hunter training program and now it's time to get familiar with firearms. Were you nervous? Yes, I, I was a little bit nervous. There is a certain amount of responsibility that one has to take before you go off shooting things. And I, uh, I also didn't want the recoil knocking me on my butt like one of those Elmer Fudd cartoons, but luckily I had a really great instructor. All right, well, let's head out to the range and see how you did. Today marks the first day of my shotgun education, and we're here with Jason Offner of Cabela's. You're gonna show me some shotgun basics, is that right? Good morning, Mary, absolutely. We're so excited to be here, and uh, welcome to the first day of your shotgun basics as you uh, continue your journey towards uh, doing some hunting this fall. Excellent. So Jason, would you mind telling me about some of the equipment we're going to be using today? Absolutely, Mary. Uh, right here we've got our headphone style hearing protection, very important. Uh, shotgun reports upwards of about 150 decibels, so okay. we want to be wearing these at all times uh, when we're on the range and in the field. And another very important piece, Mary, is our eye protection, okay. When we're on the range, we're facing circumstances with uh, breaking clay targets and things like that. We can sometimes be exposed to some shrapnel from broken targets and also Around firearms, sometimes we get some powder residue from the firing of the shotgun shells and things like that too. So very important, uh, we're gonna be wearing these at all times. This here is the rifle, or the shotgun, right? This is your shotgun, that's right, that's right. So Jason, we're really fortunate to be here today at Beaver Hill Sporting Clays. Uh, what's the next step? Well, the next step is we're gonna talk a little bit about five stand sporting clays and the different components of it, okay? Right here, we've got uh, our automated target thrower and here here we have our station cage. When it's your turn to shoot, you'll step into the station with your gun open, okay? And uh, right into this position here, we're right-handed. Our left foot will be pointing forward towards the target where we want to break it. Then we'll be ready to uh, pick up the gun after that and uh, give it a try. Okay. Great. Good. So what we're gonna do now is again, we've got our gun open so we're completely safe and we're going to call for a look at the target and get ourselves all positioned up and ready to shoot. So we're gonna ask Nick to uh, present the target to us. So go ahead. Pull. And then we're ready to load the gun and uh, go ahead and give it a try. So this is where I'll make my exit. Yeah, if you want to just step back a little bit and uh, we're going to uh, give it a try. Pull. Wow. All right. You're gonna give it a try now. Can I just say that this is the first time I've ever held a gun? I've never even been paintballing, so. Well, that's excellent. This is a great place to learn, and uh, it's gonna be an excellent experience, and we can't wait to see uh, see your reaction. So it's it's great. Okay, so, and we're ready to go. Just like this. Just there Perfect. we are. That's it. Doesn't yep. go any farther. Hey, yep. that's okay. Super. Kay. So close her up. Now we're going to bring the gun up to your shoulder, right in a comfortable position. Yeah, okay. perfect, right there. Super. Hand, yeah, just like you're shaking hands. 
forearm in a comfortable position. I do have a good handshake. I have a firm handshake, so that'll help me shoot a gun. You'll be great then. Awesome. And then like yeah, that. Head down on the gun, looking down the sight plane of the barrel. Okay, thinking about where we want to uh, track that target and break that target. We want to be a little bit low. This is where we're going to call for the target in this position. When I was shooting, I had my gun in a down position, but because this is your first time, we're going to have you up in this position here. So when we're ready to call for the target, we are going to uh, take, we're going to put the safety off. So click it forward. Okay, <laughs> we're going to call, okay. We're going to call for the target. And then at that point, we're going to go ahead and pull the trigger. For okay. real, I'm actually going to pull it. For, for real. Okay. And call for the target and pull. Pull, pull, pull. You were, that was Darn extremely it. close. You were oh. just a little bit in front of it. Oh, was I? Yeah. And how was that? Uh, it was exciting. Good. I really felt quite powerful. As you get more practice and more opportunities, you become kind of more in tune with observing the target and awareness of your gun position and stuff. But for the first time, that was excellent. Thank you, Congratulations. Jason. You're a very good teacher. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Mary, pull. Yes, I have that word down pat. I think it's what happens after you say the word that matters. Yes, yes, I didn't quite shoot any clays this time, but uh, I, I will do better in the future. Well, we know that you've got a waterfowl and a pheasant hunt coming up. Yes, and I improved drastically, actually, so. While we look forward to that, coming up, we discover an Alberta Provincial Park with a waterway that eventually drains into the Gulf of Mexico. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Fish and Game Association, Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association, Alberta Professional Outfitters Society. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. Native bull trout and cutthroat trout populations in some foothill streams are being threatened by an outsider. They're being crowded out by the eastern brook trout, a species that was introduced to Alberta over 50 years ago and whose numbers are growing. Provincial biologists, Trout Unlimited and volunteer anglers are working together to turn the tide in favor of bull and cutthroat trout. The project is being supported by Devon Energy. I teamed up with Devon environmental specialist and avid angler Robert Boyce to find out what's being done. Yep. <laughs> okay. You know, there are few things more enjoyable, at least in my book, than being able to walk one of the many streams flowing along the eastern slopes of the Canadian Rockies. On this day, I'm joined by Robert Boyce with Devon Energy, and we have a very specific task to perform. Now, this morning, I have two jobs. First job is to see that you can identify a brook trout from the native West Slope cutthroat trout that lives in these waters. And the second job is to go and catch some brook trout in order to remove some of these fish. Uh, they are an invasive species that are putting pressure on, on the native fish that are here. Removing these non-native brook trout from the streams is similar to pulling noxious weeds from your yard. If left on their own, the native species will be choked out. Of course, to remove these fish, we first have to find them, and that can prove to be a challenge on such a small stream like this. Yeah, see that little guy, he looks relaxed. Yeah, and, relaxed? And there's another one right behind that rock. He looks as relaxed as a zookeeper that's forgotten to walk the tiger cage and turned his back. That's how relaxed that fish looks, Michael. Well, he's sitting there. <laughs> he's sitting there because he's scared half to death. He's trying not to get eaten. <laughs> I think this is a I think this is a ploy because you're afraid that you're gonna put your fly in and nothing's gonna happen. I'm pretty sure nothing's gonna happen because this fish is scared out. I rest my case. <laughs> well, despite my ribbing, it was Robert who eventually landed the first fish of the day. The first thing we do is we look at the sides of the trout to see whether or not it has black spots. There are no black spots, so we know it is not a cutthroat trout. The second thing we do is look at its dorsal fin. This one does have black markings, so we know it is not a bull trout. So no black spots on the sides, black markings in the dorsal fin. That's an eastern brook trout. After moving into a promising looking pool, I was rewarded with a strike. 
There we go. Do you want to net this one or let? Right. Let's see what we got here. He's gonna come in. If you can net him and unhook him underneath that tree. Wow, look at the colors though. Do you see any black spots on the sides? No black spots. So no black spots on the side? Right. Black markings on the dorsal fin? Has to be a brook trout. Of course, there's nothing like catching more fish to be comfortable in making the right identification. When all the little ripples dissipate. There, there he is. goes. Oh, that was a nicer one. <laughs> and again, don't rip the fly off. Yeah. Let it sit. There he goes. There he is. Yeah. Came oh, back. I got him. Came back. Good work, Michael. Looking for no black right. along the no side. No black spots on the side. Perfect. And then? But we got black on the, on the dorsal fin. Distinct black markings Distinct. on the dorsal Absolutely. fin. Absolutely. Robert, what a fantastic afternoon it's been. We've been on two creeks, uh, Johnson and Willow Creek, two new creeks to the provincial program to cull the number of uh, brook trout in this system. We haven't seen a rainbow or a cutthroat trout here yet this morning. All the fish we've caught have been brook trout. It's just indicative of the number of fish in here. And this particular reach we've just fished has seen a tremendous amount of angling pressure this year, and it still contains a large number of brookies. If you go to the farthest southeast corner of Alberta, you'll find a provincial park with some special bragging rights. Cypress Hills Provincial Park has some 220 bird species and 47 different mammals, including a herd of 200 elk. Welcome to Cypress Hills Provincial Park, a location in southeast Alberta that holds many different surprises. Stay with us as we unravel some of these hidden gems. It doesn't take Alma long to discover not only the incredible scenery of the highest point between the Rockies and Labrador, but also the unique human history still stored in these remarkable hills. So here on the highest point in the Cypress Hills at 1,466 meters, there used to be an old Northwest Mounted Police Post at this location where they could look off to the south and spot rum runners and wolfers who were coming out of Montana into Canada, bringing with them liquor, rum, to sell to the local natives. Being able to watch who came across the border from the United States is but one example of the Cypress Hills being connected to places even further afield. Take, for example, this mountain bluebird that calls Mexico its winter home. And then there's this small, unassuming stream. This is another cool fact we have here in the Cypress Hills. I mm -hmm. uh, see this water in front of you? Yeah. It actually flows down to the Gulf Coast in Mexico. No way. Yeah, we're at the height of land here. So this creek called Battle Creek actually heads south across an international border to the Mississippi and finally out to the Gulf Coast. That is so neat. There are so many interesting factors here and such cool things to see. Speaking of which, Alma and Chris come across a really interesting geological formation. Chris, another neat aspect I'm seeing are these cool rocks over here. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this rock that we're looking at is actually conglomerate. And this was laid down about 65 million years ago. Wow. So if you would have come here back then, you wouldn't be looking at these lovely trees or the forest that you see now. You would be on a riverbed. And that's where you get these lovely rounded stones from. So what happened is this was laid down and this conglomerate was cemented together with a rock that has a lot of calcium in it. This has actually acted as a cap rock for the cypress cells. And it's the entire reason why it exists. What happens is we get the rain that comes through this hard conglomerate protects it from erosion and the rain will actually seep through and then come out in springs at other locations. Without this conglomerate, we wouldn't have the cypress hills. So there is yet one more surprise the cypress hills can offer a visitor, providing of course you're not afraid of the dark. Now Chris, how can stargazers take advantage of the night sky preserve at Cypress Hills? So if you're planning to come out and see stars in the Cypress Hills, I recommend you give us a call at the Visitor Centre at 403-893-3833 and check the local weather. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of different resources we do have available, including star charts. Come check in and we can send you to a bunch of really cool locations where you can have a view at an endless prairie sky mm -hmm. and find locations that are just pitch black and ideal for stargazing. Mm -hmm. uh, we also recommend if you have a pair of binoculars or a telescope, bring them. Well, Alma was hoping to do a little stargazing. It turned out that the night sky was offering a different type of light show. So with some astronomy thrown in and more earthly attributes like geological formations, flora and fauna, and steeped in human history, Cypress Hills is more than a provincial park. 
It's a fantastic classroom. This grade four class made the trip from Brooks and are about to get a course in the life of a forest. Who in this circle would use the sun? Seed. You? Why would you use the sun? Because uh, I, I need the sun to grow. You need the sun to grow, that's right. Katie gave us some um, pictures of leaves and then she gave us a sheet so we had to find um, the leaves and then we had to draw the whole plant. And for Russell here, being in the outdoors just might become a career. I'd like to keep learning because I, I want to like, live with the outdoors, like work in the outdoors when I grow up. So I'd like to learn a bit more too. While for other students, this is their first experience in an Alberta park. Very excited, yeah. All the parents said they hadn't slept. And for a lot of them, it's their first chance at being independent. A lot of the moms were saying that their kid had never really been away from home before, been to a sleepover, and it's kind of, it's a, it's a big deal. It's their first year in Canada, it's their first time being on their own, it's their first little taste of independence, so it's really special for them, they'll always remember it. There has to be some rules to protect this place because it's so special. This hands-on approach to teaching students about our wild places seems to be working. Almost always good. I've heard kids say, this is actually really fun, you know? And, and they'll be sometimes slipping and sliding in the dirt, getting dirty, but they, they all seem to really enjoy it, just being allowed to actually go out and just explore. And it would seem the lessons learned with this classroom outing have not been lost, at least not with this student. That it's just been here for so long, people have been here, everything just has a good time here. Yeah, what are some of the cool animals or plants that you've learned about here? Mm, wild turkeys. I never knew there was wild turkeys. That's cool. Wild turkeys? <laughs> Yet another interesting discovery that awaits visitors to this unique Alberta park. Wow, this is beautiful. I mean, this place is just full of wonders. I want to thank you, Chris, for showing them to us because it was very neat. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Like you said, Cypress Hill is just full of surprises. It is, and the sunset is gorgeous. How will lasers help keep ducks away from tailings ponds? We'll tell you right after this. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Trappers Association, Nature Alberta, Wild Sheep Foundation Alberta. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. No doubt you've heard about ducks landing in tailings ponds with tragic results. Right now, cannons are being used to scare birds away. One researcher is now studying whether visual deterrents are more effective than audio deterrents. When we caught up with her, she was putting a swan, spooky eye, a twirling gizmo, and laser beams to the test. These waterfowl may not know it, but they are playing an integral role in a scientific experiment here at Horlack Park in the heart of Edmonton. It's a project that's part of a bigger research project, a court order that came out of the trial of Syncrude a couple years ago. I'm involved in researching several parts of that. Monitoring is one, deterrence is another. Experimenting with deterrence is not an easy thing to do in the oil sands, partly because it's really important not to let birds land there at all. You can't really compare their likelihood of landing. By working at Horlack, I can work on a much smaller spatial scale, I can manipulate all kinds of things, and I can get a better sense of the best things to try in the oil sands. And that's what we're doing. Determining an ethical approach to keeping birds from landing on tailings ponds is one of the objectives of the research project. While audible deterrents are currently being used, they can create an issue for workers in the area. Additionally, over the long term, birds can become habituated to the noise. This research project is looking at a number of possible deterrents, including some tricks that Mother Nature herself can offer. As it turns out, swans can be very territorial. Of course, decoys would be used on a tailings pond. 
What I would like to build up to with these decoys is seeing, can we make these swans look like real swans, enough so to fool the average bird brain? For instance, if we have two swans that look like a pair, does that make them seem territorial? If we have the swans attached to little radio-controlled or uh, remotely advanced programmed little boats that drive the swans around, can that take them over the threshold that fools other birds into thinking, yep, those are real life swans and they're gonna beat me up if I stay here, I'm going somewhere else. Well, another approach just might be the use of holographic reflectors, like this gizmo. That might make it possible to protect, if you will, an area of a tailings pond that's much greater than the size of that circulating device itself. If that's possible with a device like this that doesn't make any noise and it doesn't have any collateral damage effects, that would be kind of a win-win-win for ecology, for society, and for the oil sands companies. And in terms of expense, that's a $100 unit, whereas it might have the ability to replace units that cost more like $12,000. It's this visual sensory that may hold the key to keeping waterfowl off tailings ponds. Finding the right trigger that can work at night and in poor weather conditions just might be a laser beam. And birds might be even more sensitive to them, particularly the birds that seem to be most susceptible in the oil sands. Birds like lesser scop, which are adapted to fly under really low light conditions. They're actually cued to migrate by the arrival of a winter storm, and they migrate during the darkest part of the night. They must be using wavelengths of light in the very shortest range that might make violet light the most effective for their detection and hence deterrence. Hi, I'm Brad Fenson with the Alberta Fish and Game Association with your outdoor tip of the week. You know, a lot of times when you're out fishing, seeing is believing, and that's why bobbers are so great. You can take kids out, they don't have to feel a bite, they can actually see them. And with some of the newer technologies like slip bobbers, it gives you a huge advantage from fishing from shore or when you're in a group of people trying to allow everybody to fish on one stretch of water. They work quite simply, you actually thread the line through them, you put on one of the bobber stops, and it'll, what it does is it allows you to actually reel these stops into your reel and up your rod eyelets. When you uh, set the depth, like let's say you're fishing from shore and you're, you know you want to fish eight feet of water out front, you can slide that bobber stop up eight feet, cast your hook and bobber out, the line will feed back to the bobber and you're fishing from shore where only people in boats used to be able to get to. So a huge advantage. Let's show you how to rig them up. The easiest stops to use are actually the neoprene ones and you can buy them all pre-tied at any tackle stop. And you can see that there's a little wire loop there. You just put your monofilament line through one of them, double it over, hold the tag end, and that neoprene stop will slide right onto your line. So now that will reel into your eyelets and up your reel so that you can get the bobber on. So you can set it at any depth you want. What we do now is put a, a little bead on which helps prevent that bobber stop from getting caught in the bobber. And it goes up against the stop and then you can actually put your, your bobber directly above it. So the line just threads right through those bobbers and comes out the bottom end. And there it is you're ready for fishing you just have to attach your hook so it's really simple you attach your hook now we'll just tie a clinch knot and there you are ready to get after them and you can see the whole rig here now we actually have the bobber which slides up and down the line sits on your hook which allows you to reel it right through the eyelets of your rod into your reel so you can cast it out and set that stopper at any depth that you want. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Pheasants Forever Alberta Council Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta Trout Unlimited Canada Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar.
Walleye are a very popular fish with anglers, so it's important to know how well their populations are doing. In the Lac La Biche area, walleye head upstream on the Owl River to spawn. This summer, they were met by Alberta Conservation Association biologists. Let's see how many fish showed up. The objective of the study is rather straightforward. Determine just how many walleye are heading upstream to spawn. This river has been closed to angling since the mid-90s, and scientists want a clear picture of what impact the closure has had on walleye numbers. We're trapping the spawning walleye as they go up the river. So we have two traps, one trap uh, downstream where we mark the fish and hopefully uh, catch them again in the upstream trap. So with the ratio of fish that we catch that are marked versus unmarked, we can estimate um, the spawning population of the lake going up the river. The traps are put into place right after meltout and providing the water conditions are right, biologists have about a three week window to hit the spawning cycle. These nets are then placed in a couple of key locations to trap the fish. The trap, there's a lead that go on each side. So the fish, it's kind of a funnel. They go in and enter the trap and then it's just a small entrance and they cannot get out. So the trap is kind of a box with um, net underneath on each side and nothing on top so we can go get those fish after. Next comes the task of sorting through all the fish. It turns out walleye are not the only species that spawn at this time of year. There are plenty of northern pike as well. Now the pike will be counted and released, but are not part of the ACA study. Still, good to know there appears to be a healthy number of big fish. That's, and that's not even near the biggest. Once the walleye have been sorted, they are then placed into holding buckets where the biologists can start to collect their data. What we're doing uh, at each trap, uh, we catch uh, all the fish. There is also a pike and uh, white suckers in there. So we just count them and for the walleye, uh, we measure the fish, uh, we assess the maturity level and the sex of the fish and we mark them by um, cutting a bit of their uh, dorsal uh, spine and then we release them upstream of the trap um, so they can go spawning. The spawning site is maybe around a 25 or 30 kilometer um, river length upstream of our traps. So the fish are just swimming up and go spawn up there. We catch the fish in the downstream trap, mark them, and then some of the fish um, hopefully get uh, trapped again in the upstream trap. And so with the ratio of fish we catch that are uh, marked versus unmarked, we can estimate using uh, equation and formulas the, the population of fish that are going up the river to spawn. Tight female. While it's one thing to see how the fish populations are recovering here along the Owl River, the ACA is also concerned about the land located along the shores of this important river system. We're going to be fencing the river to keep cattle out, so then we can uh, have uh, better riparian areas, so uh, avoiding uh, erosion or um, getting uh, vegetation on the banks. So that's another big part of this project. There's no question there have been many positive changes along the river over the years, and ACA biologists are optimistic about the future. What we're seeing right now in the river is really positive. We're seeing beautiful, uh, big fish in good health. I think all the effort that's been put here is really paying off. Hey, if you would like to catch previous stories featured here on Let's Go Outdoors, then track down our website at www.letsgooutdoors.ca. Remember, the outdoors is here for all of us to enjoy. If you see someone taking away from that enjoyment, call the Report a Poacher Line. Until next time, I'm Elma Mehmed-Begovic. I'm Mary Halbert. And I'm Michael Short. Let's go outdoors. <laughs>